Last week, I turned 40. Ignoring how weird that sounds to say, it also means it's been more than 15 years since I've actually had a real job and somehow beyond all my wildest expectations, I've managed to build a solid creative career for myself. I did it through filmmaking and photography personally, but this isn't a video about camera techniques or anything like that. It's about sharing some universal advice I'd give to my 20 year old self if I was starting out again. So whether you're in your 20s and just getting going, or maybe you've been around a lot longer than that, I made this video for you. So don't worry, this isn't some midlife crisis video or anything like that. It's pretty much the opposite. I'm not buying a Porsche or getting a weird little earring because one, I love my 2010 Subaru, but two, because I'm just too busy working these days. And over the last 15 years, film and photography has taken me all around the world and it's shown me things I never imagined I'd get to see. And despite a lot of ups and downs, this stuff ended up being profitable enough that I can live comfortably in the ways that are important to me. When I look back at some of the stuff I've gotten to do like taking off of a mountain airstrip in a cartel owned propeller plane while being shadowed by a military attack helicopter. Say that again. To camping on the top of Mount Basavi in Papua New Guinea, just to name a few. It's been an almost unbelievably interesting and exciting way to make a living. And when I'm present enough to think about it, I'm incredibly grateful. These days, I've put in enough reps and time that I don't have to fight too hard to get decent jobs, but I also remember very clearly how confusing and uncertain things were in the beginning. Because it's easy for me to sit here and talk about how it all worked out 15 years later, but that's not at all relatable when you're struggling to get off the ground and the future looks foggy and uncertain. So this video isn't about me telling you do this and everything's gonna be easy because that's both dumb and impossible. But I can use my birthday as an opportunity to reflect and share a few of the universal truths that only made sense after being in this game for a long time. Things that should give you a bit of hope because I promise that all the hard work can be worth it. And that's one of the most important things to keep in mind if you don't wanna drive yourself crazy. It gets better. When you're a young filmmaker or really age doesn't matter, Matter, but just whenever you're trying something new and creative, it's the not knowing whether or not it'll work out that can feel the most oppressive. You spend hours trying to figure out if like the A7 whatever that you own is enough to start with, or if you have to buy an FX3 instead, or when you haven't gotten a single work email, let alone a job offer in over a month, and you're starting to wonder if you made a huge mistake quitting your day job. That's when the demons speak up and tell you that the market is too saturated, that there is no way you're gonna be good enough to break through and that it was stupid to even try. But I promise you, it will get better. Because what you can't see in the beginning is that it's actually a lot less competitive the longer you stick around. Now that doesn't mean that it somehow gets easy, so let me explain what I mean. At the start of something new, you're up against all the other people who had a dream and a credit card, and it feels like there are thousands of others out there with cameras trying to cold call every local business trying to hustle up work for themselves. And that's true, that is exactly what you're up against at the start. But within a year, half of those people will have realized how hard this stuff is and sold their gear on Facebook Marketplace. And after five years, there's only gonna be a small handful of those people left still doing it seriously. Wait 10 years and that number is gonna be tiny. If you can claw your way through the initial churn, the field opens up a ton and the number of competitors is way, way smaller to the point where you might actually have a hard time finding people to recommend to replace you when you're too busy to take on a job. Now, I absolutely don't wanna give the impression that if you just wait around passively, you'll wake up one day and be a well-paid pro because that's obviously not true. But if you stay on the grind and actually produce stuff for a long period of time, you're gonna hit a point where you realize that there really aren't all that many people around who can bring the same skills and experience you have to the table. There's always gonna be slow times. No career is just endlessly successful. But so much of the time, what determines a filmmaker's long-term success is the fact that they're still filmmakers. Now, I'm not pretending I'm some sort of industry hotshot because I'm not. I don't have a shelf full of awards and 99% of directors out there have never heard of me. But the truth is that there really aren't that many people out there who can do what I do at a high level, and that means I get work. Yes, when I say not that many people, there are probably still thousands, maybe even tens of thousands of great doc DPs in the world, but the world is a very big place, and the longer I stick around, the more skills I pick up and the more unique I become. And because those skills stack on top of each other and I learn more and more from every new project, I start to become harder and harder to
to replace. Like lots of people can make a good frame, but can they do it in an unfamiliar or maybe even dangerous environment, surrounded by strangers and with minimal support? Not that many even want to try. And even though I do a lot more kinds of work than just like hard hitting docks, this background makes me different. And just to be clear, this isn't about me being special because anyone who works at something over time is gonna build up their own unique skill set that's gonna be different than mine. So no, it's never gonna be a cakewalk and I've definitely had my fair share of dry spells over the years, but it should be comforting to know that if you're out there making work and putting your name into the world, all you really have to do is more of the same. There's a reason Roger Deakins didn't win an Oscar in his 20s, so stick around, learn, and watch how you steadily get harder and harder to replace. Get out of that early churn and it will get better. Oh, and really quickly, this video was originally supposed to be 40 lessons from turning 40, but this video would have been like two hours long. So instead I wrote it all down in a long form essay that I emailed out to my newsletter readers already. There's more than 12,000 of you signed up for that list. So odds are some of you might've seen that. But this video comes at it from a bit of a different angle. So don't worry, it's not the same thing repeated again. But if you missed it and you're interested in reading the full version, you can sign up using the link below and I'll email it to you for free. Okay, so it's all well and good to know that sticking with something is gonna bring results eventually, but all that grinding comes with a catch. Because if all you do is study the craft of filmmaking or whatever other creative thing you're trying to do, you're not gonna have many stories to tell. And what I mean by that is that at its core, all filmmaking boils down to storytelling. And in order to tell stories well, whether in video or stills or text or whatever, you need to have a broad range of experiences to draw from, Otherwise, you're not gonna have any perspective on the world to share. So why is that a problem? Now I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one consultation calls and a question I've been asked a bunch of times now is whether or not it's okay to go off and do something that isn't related to filmmaking for a while or if it's essential to turn full-time pro as soon as possible. Really, some people are so nervous about letting up even for a second that they're worried about taking a holiday just in case they could be using that time to advance their careers instead. And I totally get it. It's competitive out there and you wanna give yourself every chance possible. But if you don't do anything outside of filmmaking or photography or whatever, you're not going to have a lot to say. Because ultimately, we all become the sum of all those little things we've done in life. And every experience and job and friend we have shapes us in subtle ways. When I look at my own career, I came to the filmmaking world pretty late. I was just turning 30. And even though I had like six years of professional photojournalism experience, I was starting from the bottom of the film world. And the reason I started so late was because I did a whole bunch of random things first. Things that might seem like a waste of time at first glance, but that completely shaped me into who I am today. So like as an example, I was a professional tree planter for many years when I was a student. And then I spent years backpacking and doing a bunch of odd jobs around the world. And I also taught English in South Korea for a couple of years. On paper, these things don't give you much of an edge as a filmmaker, but if you step back and look at the kind of work I do now and the skills that are involved, they're actually incredibly connected. And let me just break that down so it actually makes sense. Like right now I do a lot of remote work and I shoot stuff all over the world in very random places like jungles and deserts and even the Arctic. For my first feature film, I lived out of a tent for nearly four straight months. And how is it that I'm able to function well in situations like that? Like why am I okay with putting in crazy long days in the middle of nowhere and living like a feral animal? Because I already did it as a tree planter. Lots of people romanticize the idea of shooting something like Anthony Bourdain's travel show. And it's one of the references I hear the most when I ask people what kinds of things they wanna shoot in their career. But if you've spent your whole life in front of a computer, there's almost no chance you're gonna hack it on something like that. A bunch of the time my work also takes place overseas and a lot of the time the people I'm trying to film might not even speak the same language as me. But it's still my job as a DP to get their trust and film them in intimate and sometimes vulnerable situations. Now, I'm actually a pretty introverted person by nature and if you knew me when I was a shy kid, you never would have guessed I'd be doing what I am now. So if I hadn't spent all that time living out of my backpack and wandering around Asia and the South Pacific on a shoestring, there's just no way I'd be comfortable operating in the places I end up now. And since you're only gonna be able to film what people let you film, it doesn't matter how good you get at color grading or mastering your camera settings. If you aren't comfortable building relationships while being out of your element, you're probably gonna have a hard time finding interesting stories and open moments to film. And then lastly, the two years of English teaching, which was a super fun experience and definitely the hardest partying years of my life. And thank God that's over now because I'd die if I tried to drink like that again. 
but at the time it seemed like I was stuck in a job I wasn't really passionate about and just kind of going through the motions in the classroom until I can get out to be with my friends again. And for a few years, I didn't really do anything remotely related to teaching again. But then what do you know, one day there was a pandemic and I decided to start a YouTube channel and then suddenly being able to break down ideas into short, easily digestible lessons became a pretty valuable skill. And I hope none of that comes off as me bragging about my accomplishments or something because planting trees for seven and a half cents a pop and scraping by as a broke traveler and then stumbling through 30 minute grammar lessons as a scruffy and sometimes hungover ESL instructor are hardly elite positions. But the point is that if I just stayed home, even if I'd spent 12 hours a day absorbing content on the internet and filling my shelves with lenses, there's just no way I could do what this job actually requires. So all that is to say that yes, staying focused and practicing your craft are important, but make sure you're making time for life experiences as well because that's what's gonna give you a perspective. So do dumb stuff, try new things, and just be out in the world. Now the next thing I've learned over the years is sort of related, and of all the things people I talk to struggle with the most, this is probably right at the top of that list. Because the truth is, talent is important in filmmaking, obviously. You need to be good with cameras, you need to understand storytelling and have a solid well of experiences to draw from, and you need to be out there making stuff. But filmmaking is a team sport at the end of the day, and that means the human relationships you form are just as important, if not more important, than the hard technical skills. So what do I mean by that? Well, if I look at my own career, like if I really analyze every job I've had in the last few years, I'd say that 90% of them originate from the same five to 10 people. Like I just got back from filming a project in seven cities across America, filming top tier talent like Big Sean and the Chainsmokers for a multi-million dollar project. Now this isn't my typical doc style work, but I'll let you in on a dirty little secret. Doc DPs love commercial work because it pays better. And I'm sorry, commercial people just don't work as hard as scrappy doc crews because even going into double overtime on a soundstage is way easier than trying to shoot while riding across the desert on the roof of a freight train. So even though there's a lot of pressure to get the shots in the commercial world, it does make for pretty easy days compared to what I've had to deal with in the past. But based on all of that experience, why would a huge tech company reach out to me for their national promo when everything on my website points to serious documentary stuff? The answer is relationships. I'm not gonna bore you with the entire story, but how I got this job is interesting. So I've done a few seasons of the survival show alone as a series DP, and the director of that show has become a good friend. Long story short, between seasons, that director connected me to his friend for a project that never ended up happening. But during the pre-pro stage and before the gig was canceled, I drove down to Portland and met him. His wife was there too, and we all had coffee for a bit and then I went home. That shoot got scrapped, like I said, and for a couple of years, I didn't hear anything from either of them. Then out of the blue, I get an email from his wife asking if I was available to talk about a project for the massive company that she worked for. And that led to me getting hired for a 21 day commercial gig. But then if we go back even further, how did I get on a loan in the first place? Again, relationships. A friend was asked first, they couldn't do it and recommended me to take their place. So at every stage of this process, it was people that put my name forward, not an algorithm. This company didn't start Googling or browsing Instagram looking for DPs with slick reels. No, they asked people they knew, who then asked the people they knew, and eventually they found me. And all of it started from one friendship. Now that's just one story, but seriously, Almost all of my jobs come through like this. If you're running a production services company specializing in your local area, then maybe some people are finding you through search, but most of the time, it's gonna be a personal connection that actually turns into work. For the first year of my career, 100% of my work came from the same two people, and the cycle continues because my camera assistant now is getting most of his work through me, and then one day he'll give it to someone else. That's just how it goes. The takeaway here isn't to send a bunch more cold emails, though that is still a good idea. Instead, I'm trying to stress how how important it is to form a community and to really nurture the interpersonal connections you make. If a director or whoever agrees to have a meeting with you, stay in touch and keep the relationship alive. If you get along well with someone on a shoot, make the time to have coffee or a Zoom catch up with them every few months and actually be friends. There's no rule book for how to do this, but just a handful of people who like you and suggest you whenever they get asked and you can have more work than you can handle. Gear and technique are great, but it's people who hire you and getting to know more people is all networking is at the end of the day. And while we're talking about the importance of relationships, this is a good time to talk about the sponsor of today's video, Audio, because they've been supporting this channel longer than anyone else. And that support has been so important for covering the hard costs of running this channel, which is probably a lot more than you'd expect. 
I mean, yeah, first and foremost, audio provides a great service and it's hands down the best deal out there for royalty free music that I've ever found anyways. But I've kept the partnership going for so long now because of the relationship I formed with the people there. They've just been a great company to work with. They've worked with me to resolve every single issue that's ever come up, and they've never tried to interfere with the content I make. And that's a big part of the reason this partnership has been going on for almost two years now, because not only did they make it possible to keep this channel going, but when a company is like that with their business partners, then you know they're also like that with their customers. And then for me, most of the doubts I have about promoting them goes away. Let's be honest though, at the end end of the day, most people just really care about product and price. So obviously audio has to deliver there as well. And they do. Not only has it been the primary source of all the music I've personally needed for this YouTube channel and my short films for the last few years, it's also an incredible deal at just $59 a year if you decide to use the code LUKE70, which takes 70% off the normal price. That's about a quarter of what these music sites normally charge, so it's really just the best deal out there on top of being really nice people. So plug over, but if you're a filmmaker who needs music for their projects without getting sued, use the link and code in the description, save a bunch of cash, and get back to focusing on what you're interested in. All right, so last but not least, the final thing I wanna to share took me a long time to learn because when I started out in filmmaking and photography, I came into it with a flawed mindset. Not in the sense that I wasn't shooting good stuff or that I wasn't dedicated enough, but more like I expected to arrive somewhere one day. Like if I just accomplished X or worked for whatever client, that one day I'd have won the filmmaking game. And let me explain for a second because I realize that sounds a little weird. Obviously you can't win at a creative field, but sometimes, actually a lot of times along the way, I got it in my head somehow that if I could just manage to hit some arbitrary milestone, I'd wake up one morning and find that now everything made sense. Like when I was starting to shoot stills, it was the New York Times and National Geographic. As a young documentary photographer, those were the pipe dream clients that I thought working for meant you'd made it and suddenly everything would just like get easier. Well, I published photos with both of them. And in the case of the times, I even managed to get three different photos on the front page above the fold, which is pretty damn cool. But did anything change after that? Did I feel different? No, not really. I mean, yeah, it did feel good for a couple of hours or even a few days after the fact when I looked at all the papers on my desk, but once the likes and messages of congratulations slowed down, I felt pretty much exactly the same as I did before. I hadn't transformed into a fulfilled artist and all my worries about the future of my career were just kind of the same. I had the same level of skill and all that happened was I was now putting more pressure on myself to hit even bigger targets in the future. And the same thing has been true of every one of these imaginary win conditions I got in my head over the years. As a doc shooter, it was things like getting my first job as a DP and not an assistant. Then it was DPing a show for Netflix, then it was getting hired as a series DP, and so on. When you're chasing those goals, they can seem like the most important, life-changing things in the world, but when you actually get there, in my experience anyways, the view from the other side doesn't really look any different. You're gonna be the same person with the same issues and all that's waiting for you is more of the same. Which I guess could come off as depressing, but it really shouldn't be. Because if you like what you're doing, like if you actually enjoy the process of telling stories and getting better at it, then that shouldn't really change anything for you. The danger is when you start to think that there's some sort of final destination that you can arrive at because there just isn't. When I started this channel almost three years ago, I couldn't really imagine hitting 100,000 subscribers, but depending on when you're watching this, I'm either very close or already past that number. But no matter what that subscriber number gets to, the process of videos won't really change other than there being more pressure for them not to suck. Now I like making them and I'll keep making them because I enjoy the process. Because even if I hit a million subs somewhere down the line, I'll still be the same person and I won't have won anything. The only real prize, apart from a frame play button that's just gonna gather dust on my shelf, is the ability to keep making videos and sharing them. And that's enough for me. And hopefully that's enough for you too because if you're early on in your career and banking on the fact that there's some way to win this game, you're gonna be disappointed. Going back to Roger Deakins again, who finally won an Oscar after being nominated and not winning 15 times, what did he get apart from the little statue and bragging rights? Just the next movie. So yes, things get better as you gain experience, you get bigger budgets, more exciting projects, and probably a better rate for your time. But at the core of it all is just the process of making stuff and sharing it. And no matter how far along you get, that's not gonna change. Be happy with your successes and celebrate your victories for sure. But if you're expecting any reward beyond just making a living, doing that thing you like to do, 
you're gonna be constantly dissatisfied. The process is the point, and for me, that's just fine. So there we go, some of the most important lessons I've learned as a 40-year-old creative who's been at this for most of my adult life that I hope give you a bit of a different perspective on your own career. Like I said, I spun this video off of a long-form essay of 40 lessons for my 40th birthday, and if you wanna check that out, I'll put the link in the description and I'll email it to you for free. Now I'm gonna go get cataract surgery and a hip replacement because I'm officially old. See ya.